Lord Mayor's show. <laughs> I must say it gives me great pleasure to speak at the centenary meeting because um, I belong to the association for some time and rather more than half the association's total history, I may say. And when I first joined, there were quite a number of original members left. I wasn't actually one, in spite of appearances, but there were quite a number when I first joined. And ever since, well, ever since 1890, the BAA has had an observational record second to none. And now that we have all these superb modern developments, people do sense sometimes to say, where is amateur astronomy going, and what's the use of it? And in the space of exactly eight minutes, I want to try and give you one or two ideas that I think may possibly go some way to answering these questions. And um, I'm going to begin by showing you two photographs that I took myself. Both are of observatories, and they show how the changes come across. Oh, <laughs> uh, that wasn't one. That was my first picture, and that's certainly an observatory. This is a picture I took recently at La Silla in South America, in the Atacama Desert, and you have there the world's most up-to-date instruments. So in place of that, what can the amateur astronomer now do? And I think the answer is, over the next hundred years, he'll be able to do just as much as he's done over the past hundred years, but he's got to adapt. And in fact, amateurs have adapted tremendously during the last 50 or 60 years. And there are some amateurs whom I would call dinosaurs. And I am a dinosaur. <laughs> I'm one of these people who actually looks through a modest telescope. I don't have a computer. I don't have a photometer. I wouldn't understand um, a binomial theorem if you handed it to me on the end of a skewer. I'm still one of those who observes things like the moon. And there is a dinosaur's drawing of the surface of the moon. And um, going back only a few decades, we were very busy charting the lunar surface. And we were doing it visually. Then along came amateur photography. This photograph by one of our leading photographers, our immediate past president, Commander Hatfield, who produced that magnificent lunar atlas some time ago. And there have been many splendid amateur pictures of the moon. And we were very busily charting the lunar surface. And now, in view of, well, this kind of thing, the actual the Earth seen from the neighborhood of the moon, and an actual scene on the lunar surface, with Jack Schmidt examining a large lunar rock, what can the amateur still do? Believe me, the answer is a great deal. And remember, the amateur has got one great advantage. He can concentrate upon time-dependent phenomena. And there is still a great deal of lunar research to do, particularly with regard to TLP, or transient lunar phenomena, whose, whose reality, I think, is no longer in doubt, but which we don't yet thoroughly understand. And the lunar section is very busily working upon that, and will continue to do so in the coming years. And that's only one of the many aspects of lunar research that is not covered in the main elsewhere. And then, um, what about the sun? We have a very flourishing solar section. Amateurs also observe eclipses. There's one picture of a total eclipse, an amateur one. And while we've got to admit that those pictures are taken very largely for enjoyment, there is still useful solar work for the amateur to do, because uh, he may easily get some kind of uh, exciting, short-lived, transient phenomenon that's not obtained elsewhere. And we now know that amateurs do use very advanced instruments. Commander Hatfield has a fully fledged spectrohelioscope, so in any stretch, there are others in our association who are doing really excellent work there. And just in passing, I was over at Cape Canaveral earlier on this month to watch the launch of the solar polar probe Ulysses, and I can't resist showing you the picture that I took as it went up. And there Ulysses on the way, and the the top just goes off the picture. There it goes, Ulysses now on its way to the sun. So amateurs can do work there. And of course, amateurs are peculiarly well placed to study aurorae or polar lights, which can't be seen from many of the world's great observatories, at least not very often. And well, here's a typical, well, not a typical, a very good amateur picture. This was taken by Terry Mosley, who we heard a few minutes ago, and that was taken from Northern Ireland. And the amateur aurora network is of tremendous value to physicists, solar observers, and astrophysicists in general. And then now, coming on to the planets, what can we do there? What about Mercury? <laughs> Not very much. What about Venus? Yes, indeed. 
There the drawing of Venus, it doesn't show very much. You can't see a great deal on Venus. I mean, now know what Venus is like. Not a really welcoming kind of place, I'm afraid. And yet, observations of those upper clouds are important, and Venus, uh, at the moment, is being monitored, being monitored by the Magellan probe, but there are many times, and there will be many periods in the coming century, when there will be no space monitoring of Venus, and that's where the amateurs come in. And even more so, perhaps, on Mars. There's a photograph of Mars, taken with an Earth-based telescope. It shows the polar caps, it shows the dark areas, it shows the deserts. Well, now we know what Mars is really like. There's a picture of the Martian surface. So what can the amateur do? And the answer is, again, a great deal, particularly, I think, on Mars, because we come back again to what I call time-dependent phenomena. And at this moment, Mars is not being monitored by any space probe. And therefore, suppose we have a major dust storm, as we had in, shall we say, 1911 so expertly recorded by our own observers in our Mars section, uh, then directed by Antonioli. If there's going to be a major dust storm on Mars, we want to know, and amateurs are the people to get it. Because it's fair to say that nowadays, the amateur, using a modest telescope, can actually see as much detail on Mars as can be photographed by professionals with the very best telescopes in the world. And professionals, generally speaking, are not doing it. Therefore, we must keep a watch on Mars. That's the kind of thing we are setting out to do. And also, the same applies to Jupiter. There's a picture of Jupiter. I know that the Galileo probe is on its way. It hasn't got there yet. It's got to go by a very roundabout route. So I say, rather like going from Brighton to Bonn, by way of Carlisle. Then we'll get there in the end. But at the moment, there is no probe monitoring Jupiter. And uh, very exciting things have been happening with the virtual disappearance of the South Equatorial Belt. Tremendous things are happening on Jupiter, and amateurs have been those to study it. And that's the kind of thing that we do, and it's important in any respect. And then, what about Saturn? There's a picture of Saturn, not one you've seen before, I think. That is the first picture of Saturn sent back by the Hubble Space Telescope. And you think you'll think it really is rather good. And it shows that even though Hubble may not be so good as was originally intended, it can still carry out outstanding work. And certainly, that's the best Earth-based picture of Saturn that I have ever seen. But again, even though Hubble can do that, uh, there are no space probes monitoring Saturn now, and there won't be many Hubble pictures of Saturn, I'm afraid, and we've just had this exciting discovery of a white spot. Well, the last really brilliant white spot was in 1933, discovered by Will Hay. And I remember seeing that white spot very well, just as I've seen this present one. But but for amateur observation, that white spot might so easily have gone undetected. And that's the kind of thing that people like the dinosaurs can still do. <laughs> when we come out to the outer planets, Uranus, Neptune, well, as we know, the section directed by Andy Hollis is doing sterling work there. Maybe I think about magnitudes, but something can be done. I won't say we can do very much on Pluto, uh, there is the Hubble picture of Pluto, the ground based on the left, the Hubble on the right, and at the moment, as we know, uh, we are just coming to the end of a very exciting uh, series of occultations and eclipses of Pluto and Charon. But if Pluto does occult a star, as happens sometimes, then that's the time for the amateurs to get to work, because professionals can't remove their big telescopes around, and the amateurs can. And that's where the, the more sophisticated kind of amateur with his photometer actually comes in. And when it comes now to sheer discovery, what about minor planets? There's the late Frank Atkins photograph of Vesta. We know that Brian Manning, who we heard the earlier this evening, has actually discovered asteroids. And amateurs can do that, even though you do need the skill of a Manning. I must say, I wanted to show you a picture of Brian Manning's observatory which I took when I last saw him, but unfortunately I found I had my thumb over the lens, so I can't do that. <laughs> Nevertheless, we know how good his observing, his observing is, and amateurs can and do discover asteroids. And of course, they also discover comets. This one, Austin's Comet, was discovered by an amateur, Rodney Austin, in New Zealand. And uh, like others, like our own George Orcock, like the late Pat Bennett, he is one of the band of amateur comet hunters who may always make spectacular discoveries. And that one did all go well. And it wasn't Rodney's fault that his comet turned out to be about as exciting as a dead court. That was not his fault at all. <laughs> but of course, I'm rather prejudiced. 
I'm a solar system man, and now amateurs are going way outside the solar system, and we know the sterling work that variable star observers do. But more on that, they're hunting for supernovae. People like Ron Harbour, and there's Ron's observatory, and there's his telescope. They are hunting for supernovae, and they will find them. And as we know, the leading discoverer of supernovae in the world at the moment, the Reverend Rodney Evans, is an amateur, and he does it because he doesn't live here, he lives in Australia, he works with a comparatively small telescope. And the early detection of these supernovae is very important. And amateurs are now no longer confined to working with very small instruments. They now use things like CCDs. And there's a picture of a CCD of the kind of amateurs now use. And my last slide shows a supernova in an external galaxy. And the early detection of these is of vital importance. And so, I would say now, there are three kinds of amateurs. There are the dinosaurs. We still work in the way we did. And there's still work for us to do. There are the more advanced amateurs, people who work with photometers and CCDs. And they carry out work of professional interest as well as amateur. And finally, I think in the next century, we're going to come now to even more advanced amateurs who are working internationally just as the professionals are. So all in all, I would say that the thing is now that your amateur astronomer of today and tomorrow has to be more specialized. He has to know more, he has to narrow his interests, but in his own way, he can still make an outstanding contribution. Our association has done this for the past hundred years. We have moved with the times. From observers with small telescopes in 1890, we've moved through the, the dinosaur stage, the photographic stage, we've now entered the really modern stage, where our observers use things like CCDs, spectroscopes, photometers of all kinds, and they will continue to do so. And I have absolutely no doubt that in the coming hundred years, amateur astronomy is going to flourish as much as it's ever done. And I'm quite sure that um, in the hundred years from now, at our bicentenary meeting, there is someone saying to you just what I'm saying now, and saying, now let's look forward to the BAA's third century. Thank you very much. notices that ends the centenary meeting of the BAA. The notices are as follows.